Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel, and this is joint work with Moore at CMU and Ramesh at Akamai. As we're going to talk about a CDN, let's take a quick look at how to, a CDN might look like, right? We probably all know that. So we have our happy users here at the bottom, and we have the content providers who have all the content we want at the top. And the CDN is basically a layer in between, right? So it's many, many caching servers that store, hopefully, the popular objects um, that are requested by users. And of the many users, user requests, most of them, or almost all of them, are going to be satisfied by the CDN server. So what we are interested in is what happens inside a CDN server. So there's two components, the HOC and the DC. The HOC is the first caching level. It's an in-memory cache that is very fast, but also quite small. And the disk is the second caching level, very fast, but a little bit smaller, uh, a little bit slower, right? We're interested in building a better HOC system. And in order to do this, our performance goal is to optimize the object hit ratio. And the object hit ratio is defined as the number of requests served by the HOC divided by the total number of requests. Quite intuitive, I think. And we want to maximize the object hit ratio, which is the fraction of requests served by the HOC. Let's review quickly what has been done previously in this field, which I'm not able to spend the whole field, but I'll give you an idea of what has been done there. So there's two, two types of decisions a, a, a cache can make, right? The first decision is what to admit into the cache, and the second decision is what to evict from the cache once it is full. And what we're going to see here is that most of the prior work has looked on the eviction side, okay? For example, historically, you probably all know about the least recently used policy. It's still today the most widely used policy in practice. For example, in web caching, the Nginx and the Varnish systems both rely on LRU. In academia, in the 2000s, people have looked at various additional metrics besides recency, for example, frequency. And the question there was to, how do we efficiently combine these two things? You probably know about the adaptive replacement policy um, arc that was very famous from that time. And more recently, people have looked at how can we make use of multi-core processor systems? How can we boost caching system throughput? So people have developed concurrent LAU variants. The common scheme here, as I mentioned before, is that all of this evolution happened on the eviction side of caching system. However, there's also the other decision we can make, which is the admission decision. And all of these systems typically admit all the requests into the cache. What we're going to argue is that by admitting everything into the cache, we're missing a key issue. And that key issue is that not all objects are the same, in particular in CDN traffic. So here on the left, you can see the object size distribution at an Akamai CDN server we, we analyzed. So on the left, on the y-axis, you see the cumulative distribution. And on the x-axis, you see object sizes from one byte all the way up to several gigabytes. That's very high variability. That's almost nine orders of magnitude of variability. Coming back to the question of whether we should admit every object into the cache, now think about this variability. There's a mouse. Should we admit this very small object? OK. But this very large elephant, should we admit this really large object into the cache? Remember, our hawk is really small. So we might want to choose to favor small objects when admitting objects into the cache. And it turns out a few companies already know this. Akamai already knows this. The big question is, how can we do this well? How do we do this really, really well and efficiently? And unfortunately, we as academics, we haven't been really helpful in answering that question because it turns out almost all the theoretical work on caching considers equal-sized objects. So we can't really answer that question. So now I told you we want to do size aware admission and that companies don't know how to do it well. You probably ask what's so hard about it, right? So let's take a look. What's the easiest size aware admission policy we can do? What's the easiest thing? Well, we could do a fixed size threshold, right? Seems easy enough. We admit everything below a threshold, which we call C for the moment. 
and every object that has a size above that threshold will never get into the cache. Seems simple enough, but which C would we pick? We want to pick the C that maximizes the overall object hit ratio, but that's not at all obvious. So here you see the object hit ratio as a function of C. And in one CDN server we analyzed, it looks like this. So there clearly is a best C. But this best C is only the best one at a certain point in time in the morning. A few hours later, the curve looks like this, and you have a totally different C that is optimal. And in the evening, it looks again very, very different from that. The reason for this behavior is that there's different types of traffic that are served by the CDN server. In the morning, you, might, you can imagine there's more news traffic, smaller objects, and in the evening, it's more video traffic and photos and so on and so forth. So because of these changes in traffic mix, we also have changes in the best threshold. Now, I told you we have to adapt that threshold, but maybe aren't you wondering whether there's a way around picking that threshold? Can we avoid picking that threshold? And maybe the problem is having that fixed size threshold, which is kind of a binary decision, right? What about we make it a little bit more flexible? We could do probabilistic admission. So a small object gets a very high admission probability, and a large object gives a low admission probability. That's certainly much more flexible, should be easier to do, right? Well, it turns out there are many, many curves we could choose for the admission probability. For example, here's the exponential family of admission probability functions, which can look like this, which can look like that. They all depend, again, on a C parameter. And again, which curve we choose makes a huge difference for the hit ratio. So we are left again with this problem. We need to adapt C. And this is where adapt size comes in. This is our caching system, which happens to be one of the first caching systems focused on admission to the cache. And it's also the first system that continuously adapts the parameter of size over admission. So we adapt that parameter with, si with the traffic. Over time, we continuously optimize the hit ratio of the hawk. There are three components to adapt size. The first component is that we measure and model the traffic to the server. Then we feed that kind of traffic to a calculation that outputs the best C parameter. And then we enforce that C parameter and continuously update that into our, our, in our admission control component. So let's jump into the most interesting part here. How do we calculate the best C, right? And you, you might recall, as we've seen before, these different curves that change over time. So we have this red curve in the morning, this green curve in the early afternoon, and the blue curve in the evening. Now, ideally, we would go and find the best C at any point in time for every second of the day. Well, that's a little bit too hard. Let's simplify that problem a little bit. And let's say we look at delta interval at a short time interval of a few minutes. And for each of these delta intervals, we want to find the best C. So what can we do here? So the traditional approach in cache tuning, there's many, many works that do that, is hill climbing. For example, using shadow cues or simulations. Let's take a look um, on the right, on the blue line, how hill climbing would work in this case. So let's assume we start in that left corner here, and we climb up that hill. We stop here because that's a peak. But as you can see, that's not the optimal threshold value. It's actually very suboptimal compared to the optimal one. It doesn't really give us a gain compared to not using size aware admission. Now, we can't really make any assumptions about that curve. So there may, may be many, many local optima, many non-convexities. So hill climbing is really not the right choice here when we want to build a robust caching system. And this is where adapt size contributes something new, because we developed a Markov model, which actually allows us to predict this curve. And in this way, we can get a global optimization and quickly find the actual optimal threshold. So now, I told you we have this model, but now you're probably asking, how can we get that curve, right? How do we get the OHR versus C curve? And I mentioned it's a Markov chain. So why a Markov chain? Well, a Markov chain is really good at tracking state. 
And what we are interested in is basically the in or out state for every object. Because if we know an object is in the cache and a request comes in, we get a hit, and otherwise we get a, we get a miss. And we need to these use, we need to know the in and out state for all the objects at any point in time. This gives us the following algorithm. For every delta interval and for every potential value of C, we create such a Markov chain, solve it, and this way obtain the object hit ratio for the C. And we do that for all the potential C values and simply find the C to maximize the object hit ratio. Well, that sounds easy enough, right? But why hasn't this been done before? Like, why is everyone using hill climbing so far? It turns out that solving these Markov chains is actually not quite as easy as it sounds, because we need to keep track of all the possible combinations of which object is in the cache or out of the cache. And that's an exponential state space. And we have millions and millions of objects. So if you wanted to solve this Markov chain, kind of brute force, you wouldn't be able to do that in time. Our contribution is to find an approximation for this Markov chain that has a linear state space. And because our approximation has a linear state space, we can solve it very quickly and this way find the best, the best threshold C. So now that's all theory, and I'm talking at NSDI, so you're probably wondering about the implementation. How can we actually do this in practice? So let's look back at our CDN server. As you remember, it has the HUC and the DC in there. And adapt size fits into that um, CDN server by being kind of a doorkeeper to the HUC. How do we implement that doorkeeper? We considered Varnish, which is a widely used HUC system. Um, it's a highly concurrent implementation. It serves, frequently serves traffic a tenth of gigabit. It's used by Wikipedia, many CDN um, startups, so it's a well-established system. And we implemented adapt size by incorporating it into Varnish. As we've seen before, there are three components to adapt size. The one in the middle we already know, right? That's the Markov chain. That's where all the math happens. But in order to have that Markov chain solve for the object hit ratio, it relies on measurements. It relies on some information about the traffic. So let's take a look how do we get that information? How do we take traffic measurements? Because we're in a concurrent caching system, there are a few challenges when you want to take traffic measurements. The first problem is that because we have these skewed popularity distributions, many, many requests, almost half of the requests are, requ uh, are concentrated on a small set of objects. So when different cores, different threats handle the same objects, we could have right conflicts. We don't want that. We don't want to have any inaccurate statistics here. So the other approach you could take would be to introduce locks and simply synchronize the whole system. Well, there's been a lot of work at NSTI that tells you if you want to build a fast caching system, don't introduce any locks. We want to avoid locks as much as possible. So when we, when we implemented it upsize, we used a producer consumer pattern that clearly separates who reads and writes statistics, and we used a concurrent ring buffer to basically at all the cores dump their statistics there. And this way, we get a lock-free implementation. The other part of adapt size is enforcing the admission control. And here, we come back to how we defined admission control in the beginning, which is a very, very simple defini definition. Because we simply need to know the current C value and the object size, and then we admit with a probability that depends on C and size. This admission probability can be independently computed by all the concurrent threats. So we don't need, we don't have any state like admit after a certain number of requests. We simply calculate the admission probability and we are done. So there's no synchronous state and we again have a lock-free implementation and just a few requests on that critical path that every request um, takes in the, in the hawk. So let's take a look how we evaluated adapt size. We used Akamai request traces, production traces, and replay that on a few, on, on many, many clients in a data center and serve this traffic to a Hawk system that has, that matches the Akamai production configuration of the CDN server we analyzed. We evaluated three different Hawk systems, which is an unmodified version of Varnish, Nginx, and AdaptSize. 
And every time a miss occurs in the hawk, we send that to the disk cache, which uses an unmodified version of Varnish. And if yet again a miss occurs, we send that to an origin server, which basically emulates web servers that has the source of all the web objects. So let's see how we do. So after we spend so much effort in building um, an, a self-tuning system, how much do we win by that? So we compare it to Varnish, Nginx, and Adapt Size. Um, let's quickly recall what they do. Varnish admits everything. It uses LIU for eviction. Nginx uses a frequency filter, which basically admits only objects that have a certain request frequency and uses LIU for eviction. We manually tune that frequency filter for Nginx. And Adapt Size uses our adaptive size for admission policy and concurrent LIU. So here are the results. For Varnish, we get about a 30% object hit ratio. For Nginx, we get a 40% hit ratio. And for Adapt Size, almost 60%. So compared to these production systems, we get a huge improvement in hit ratio. That's quite significant, but those are production systems, maybe not the most recent state of the art. So we also compare to various research-based systems. I'm not going to show you all the systems we compare to. They're all in the paper. Here's just a selection of the ones that fared the best in, on our traces. So we compared adapt size to LIUK, segmented LIU, 2Q, and TLFU, TLFU is a very, very recent paper in this domain. And they're all doing recency and frequency combinations. Actually, none of them incorporate size into their decisions. And compared to these systems, you can again see adapt size gets a very significant improvement of the object hit ratio. But if we look at, take a closer look, it's actually more significant because all of these systems here marked in gray, they rely on manually tuned parameters. And compared now to the second best system, we get a very significant improvement of 67% higher hit ratios. Now, the whole purpose of building adapt size was to get this very robust and kind of optimal system. So now let's take a look at how robust adapt size um, happens to be if we introduce artificial traffic mix changes. So here, after 30 minutes, we start with a web traffic mix and we switch to web social traffic mix, which has a very, very different threshold. And then after another 30 minutes, we get a totally different traffic mix where we have all the video traffic. And we compare adapt size to an offline tuned variant, which we call size aware opt. So this variant looks a million requests into the future and always picks the best threshold. So it's an impractical policy. But you can see it's kind of, kind of all the way up there at 80% hit ratio in this case. And adapt size is very close to this optimum almost all the time only right after one of those traffic mix changes occurs, it takes a delta interval to basically find the new threshold C. The third variant would be to use hill climbing. And as we can see in this experiment, hill climbing usually adapts very slowly and even sometimes gets stuck. In the paper, you have many, many more experiments, tenth of experiments, where we show that this is actually a frequent occurrence. Now, to come to a conclusion, to sum up what we did here, um, in this paper, we set out to maximize the object hit ratio of the hot object cache, which was defined as the fraction of requests served by the hawk. Our approach was to use size-based admission. And our key insight was that we need to adapt this parameter C over time. Adapt size now is our proposal how we can adapt C using a Markov model. And as a result, we've seen we get very significant gains in the object hit ratio. There are many, many more metrics and many, many more concerns you might have when we are changing a key component in the CDN server, like you might be thinking about the throughput, the disk utilization, the byte hit ratio, or the request latency. All of these things we evaluated in our paper, I can just tell you they look very promising, and I'm happy to receive your questions about those. As a last remark, um, Obviously, we open sourced our system. You can find it on GitHub. Thanks, everyone. Happy to take your questions. Yep. Uh, here, I think I'm the first. So. Sure. Yep. I'm, I'm also from NetApp. So you use the hit ratio for the cache hit. So it's a, I think it's a typical approach, but. In reality, the end user latency matters. I mean, you said actually you saw that in the paper, but I didn't see the result. But the thing I want to point out actually is uh, the reason using not caching the big object 
uh, I mean, the caching pol accepting the bigger object, not accepting the bigger object to effectively prevent that big object actually polluting the caches, right? But there is a different latency values for the losing big object in the cache and the small object to cache, right? Mm -hmm. cache, cache hit ratio kind of flatten all those things into the into one sort of yes. space, right? Mm -hmm. in the latency, did you get the, any effectiveness? Could we get to the question, please? Yes. Effectiveness of your scheme has changed it when you change your measure metric from the hit ratio to the latency, like how much is different? I'm not sure I fully understood your question, but certainly the question is, which metric should we be looking at, right? And commonly, let me right. first say... We should look at the latency and then how... How, how should we... Okay, okay, okay. Okay, we haven't... I think it would be a possible future work to include the latency as performance objective in, uh, into our model. We haven't done that. However, we evaluated the system as a whole and we observed... Um, I could show that quickly maybe. Oh no, okay, I can't change it here. We observed that the disk utilization, because we have many fewer random requests going to the disk, and we're actually using spinning disks here as in that Akamai server, the disk utilization goes way down because the hawk is so much more effective. And because of that, the overall latency, like request latency of that CDN servers, is actually improved by more than 30% even the tail latency in that case. Because now if many, many requests arrive at that server in the same moment and the disk utilization is lower, you have basically more resources available to, to work with that. So we're using kind of an indirect approach because we know by boosting the hit ratio, we also do something good for, for the disk cache. Okay. Uh, Shankar from at and Labs. Um, so I have two questions. You get the to pick one. Um, sure. Um, <laughs> So the difference in the latency distribution when an object is fetched from the cache versus when it's fetched from the disk mm -hmm. is order of you know a few milliseconds, which is not going to make significant difference from the end user perspective because typically web is not composed of one object but multiple objects. So yep. the bottleneck is clearly elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the applications where you envision mm -hmm. this is going to give you significant benefits? Yep. The real reason to serve an object from the hawk is that the hawk is an in-memory cache, so you can serve traffic at much higher rate. It's not exactly the request latency of individual requests where we win a lot. It's simply, as I said before, that the disk utilization goes down because we can serve more requests from the hawk. It's more a kind of queuing effect that happens in that CDN server, and we bring down that queuing in front of the disk. Okay. Um, the second oh, question. Thank you. Have you Next question over here. Uh, Andrew May, Viasat. Have you looked at other things besides file size, such as file type and the domain that it came from, to see whether that impacts the emit policies? So your question is whether we looked at policy, caching policies that incorporate more information Correct. that we might have about the object. We haven't. I think that's a good, good future direction. Uh, Peter Matsko from NetApp. So you showed that uh, you perform better than uh, the frequency-based admission. Do mm -hmm. you have any uh, insights or like you share any insights about why it performs better than frequency-based? So I think if you treat two objects that have the same frequency but very different object sizes, the same, you will always lose when under the metric of object hit ratio. Because both objects give you the same credit with regard to your metric, but one object costs you a lot more. So frequency by itself is just not enough information. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phil Gibbons, CMU. Can you say a little bit more about the actual eviction you use? Because you have different sized objects. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about size-based admission, but not size-based right. eviction. Good point. Um, so. Two questions here, I think. So the first question is, which policy did we actually use? We just used LIU itself for eviction without any changes, without looking at size. So size is only considered for the admission component. The other question is, are there eviction policies that incorporate size? And yes, there are. The problem with all these policies is that, that they're really complicated. So we're looking only at policies that have an, a constant, comp, constant time overhead per request. A while ago, like 20 years ago, people introduced like more complicated 
like where you order all the objects and then you have kind of a log n factor in there, we haven't looked at these more complicated policies because no one actually implemented them in practice. So they are there, we haven't looked at these complicated things. Okay. Hi, um, I'm HB from RIT and you said that hill climbing is a naive approach and it makes sense to go to um, a better but more intense model like building a mark of chain. Mm -hmm. Have you considered maybe something that's a little better than hill climbing like simulated annealing or some other such approach that was developed by the AI community? I mean, hill climbing has been around for ages. It's older than I am. So, sure, sure. So, there. so we have partially looked at this. So we looked at um, kind of randomized hill climbing where you just spawn like additional pointers and basically at random points. The problem is that all these approaches rely on a, on a fundamental assumption of stationarity, that this curve is kind of stationary and over time you can walk on it. But we observe that the curves also change over time, so this is how we arrived at the model. So we can actually find at any delta interval basically the whole curve and basically get, the, get to view the whole model. So you could technically say, okay, why don't you save the whole request trace of the whole delta interval and then simulate many, many, many things in parallel. We haven't done that because that just imposes a very high overhead. So the Markov model just needs aggregated request statistics. So they are kind of easy to get. But if you want to run many simulations, you need to have the whole request trace of, I don't know, the past 10 minutes, which is just a lot of overhead. Thank you. Thank you. A last quick question. Um, so the, tr the cache sizes you used in your experiments were very small. Yes. Sort of 1.2 gig. Uh, mm -hmm, could you mm -hmm. comment on that? And what would happen if we made them more um, modern? Yes. So um, that's a very good question. So at Akamai, we just matched the, so our configuration matches the production configuration of the Akamai server we took the traces from. So this is how we arrived on that. I can comment on how adapt size works for much larger cache sizes. For example, Wikipedia has been evaluating our system more recently, like they also operate a CDN, and they have, I think, like tens of gigabytes, like 80 gigabyte hawk sizes. And they're, obviously the numbers are different, but the improvement, if you compared how much more cache capacity you would need to achieve the hit ratio of adapt size, is very similar. So kind of the relative improvement we achieve even for large caches is very similar. And I think the reason for that is, is that once you have a larger system, you also just want to serve more traffic. So you also have a higher object universe and just more diversity going on. And then you again have to choose very carefully. Yes. So let's thank our speakers one last time.